Our gospel reading today is taken from the gospel of Mark, and I will warn you, it's hard to listen to. This is a hard reading from the gospel of Mark. We're going to unpack it a little bit later, but listen to what the Spirit might speak into your life in this difficult reading from the gospel of Mark. This is in Mark 9, chapter, chapter 9, verses 38 through 50. Mark 9 and 38. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will soon after be able, able to speak ill of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly, I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose their reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand offends, causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. May God bless to our understanding this reading from God's holy word. And to God's name be glory and praise. Amen. What a difficult reading this morning from the Gospel of Mark. I really would have preferred to preach from the text in James once again. But it didn't seem fair to leave all these words about dismemberment and flames and hell just kind of in the air without any kind of explanation. Also, today is a day when churches have been asked to speak out against Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism being the idea that conservative Christian values need to be the law of the land and that there should be no separation of church and state. And frankly, the Mark text lent itself better to that discussion than the James text. Because this passage in Mark begins with the disciples coming to Jesus with a question. Hey, this guy who claims to know you, we don't know him. We tried to stop him from doing deeds of power in your name, but we don't know this guy. And Jesus says, leave him alone. You don't know who knows me. You don't know all of my friends. Leave him be. It's not your problem. It's not your job to decide who is mine and who is not mine. Have salt in yourselves. In, otherwise, in other words, keep your own flavor. Keep your own identity. Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. Just live and let live is kind of what Jesus is saying here. In these days when the lines between us are so sharply drawn, in these times when politicians are using our differences to divide us and to empower themselves. In these days when people feel safe retreating into their little corners and then villainizing anybody who's in a different corner. In these days when the Christian faith itself is used as a weapon and a tool to harm and to divide people. Let us too have salt in ourselves. Let us keep our flavor and be at peace with one another. It was 14 years ago, just before moving down here. I was still keeping a blog about the Allegheny National Forest, and that blog was actually pretty popular. My articles got republished by the local tourism bureau up in Warren, Pennsylvania. And so I was kind of a travel writer for a while, small scale. But at that time, right before moving down here, the Rainbow People did their annual gathering 
in the Allegheny National Forest. Now, the rainbow people are 21st century hippies, and they've been doing this since 1972. They meet in a national forest. This time, there were 12,000 of them. 12,000 people in the woods. They were meeting in the Allegheny National Forest, and they were camped out. They were not in a campground. They were way back in the woods because all they need is a big clearing where they can do their dances and do their guided meditations and a stream where they can get water. And so for my blog, I decided to go out there and find the rainbow people in the woods. It was fun. Now the rainbow people come from various different backgrounds, but I would say most of them are more bohemian types, 21st century hippies. And it was fun to see 12,000 people camped out so far back in the woods. And they had these banners all in the trees saying, welcome home and welcome to eternal life and one love. And everyone was so friendly. Everyone I made eye contact with shouted, welcome home. I stopped making eye contact. It felt strange to be welcomed home because I was probably the only local there. There were people from the West Coast, people from Alaska, and most of them would never come back to that place. People offered me food, lentils, vegan stuff, but food anyway, it was a nice offer. Alcohol is strictly forbidden, but they offered me water, they offered me conversation and smiles, and there was dancing and there was music everywhere, live music, no electric instruments. One large dance in the main meadow was maybe 50, maybe 100 people, all in a circle. And they would step three steps to the right, and then three steps to the left, and then they would lean forward and go, hmm. And it was all to the beat of a big African bongo drum. It was almost scary to look at. And because no one's cell phone worked out there, there was a message board to get messages to people. And there was a desk with a banner above it that said information and rumor control. And banners would show the way to shared campfires because you had to share your campfires for cooking. They wanted to be responsible stewards of the land and shared latrines. And some banners proclaimed messages like one love or peace within, peace without. I liked it. It was like an enormous camp meeting for hippies. And they were also friendly. Recently, it, this has nothing to do with my sermon. These past five weeks on my day off, I have been looking for that meadow in the woods. And it took me five times to find it. The trail's gone. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's three miles from the nearest dirt road. I found it on Google Earth, but finding the way into it was not easy. On my fifth attempt, I finally discovered that big clearing in the woods where I had seen 12,000 people all milling about half dressed. And it was eerily silent and the milkweed and the goldenrod were up to my chest. And what can you do? I took a selfie with the meadow in the background and I put it up beside a picture I took in 2010 of that same meadow, a buzz with all those people. The thing struck me about going there in 2010 was that I clearly was an outsider in that group. People saw me, people greeted me, people welcomed me, but they were so non-judgmental. I didn't join in the dances or the chanting. I didn't know what the appropriate response was when they said, welcome home. I just wandered about observing, taking pictures, which I learned later you're not supposed to do. They didn't care. On the other extreme, I remember visiting a very large church in Canton, Ohio years ago, where the local symphony had come in to help the choir with Handel's Messiah. And there was a cello player over here in the hallway tuning his cello or doing whatever they do. He had long hair. He maybe looked a little bit effeminate. And the group of young church members, young ones, was standing at a distance whispering to each other about him. And one of them said, we need to go over there and tell him about Jesus. Now I ask you, who had the spirit of Christ? The rainbow people or the Christians? It's all too common, isn't it? Ironically, the Christians were willing to judge a guy for his haircut, 
and whisper about him, but they never did go over and tell him about Jesus. And honestly, it would have been a misguided thing to do. But if you honestly believed someone was in danger of hell because of their haircut, the kind thing to do would be to tell them about Jesus, I guess, or at least about a barber. This reminds me of the parable of the Good Samaritan, where it's the outsider pagan Samaritan who enacts God's love. Whereas the people who ought to be acting out God's love, the good religious folk who walked down the road that day, they're so basking in their self-righteousness that they fail to live according to the love they proclaim. This is the question, isn't it? It's always the question. Who's in and who's out? And who gets to decide? We have a lot of judgmental Christians in this country today, vying for power, trying to force their agenda and their values on Christians and non-Christians alike, and it makes us all look bad. Worse, it creates a society where it's dangerous to disagree. And what did Jesus say when he was confronted by the judgmental nature of his own bestie, John, and of his own disciples? When they tried to stop someone they didn't know from laying claim to the name of Jesus, he said, leave him alone. He's not hurting you. Just leave him alone. It's not your place to decide who's in and who's out. Have salt in yourselves. In other words, keep your own flavor, keep your own identity, and be at peace with each other. So we've just heard this harrowing reading from the Gospel of Mark. This stuff about hell and fire and plucking out eyes and cutting off hands. What do we make of that? Well, I have spoken about this verse, this segment in Mark and several of the other Gospels so many times that I don't want to say too much about it today. You probably know my spiel already. But just as a reminder, when Jesus says hell, he's using the word Gehenna. And Gehenna was a real place. Gehenna was the municipal trash heap just outside Jerusalem where they burned the trash. And so when Jesus says what he's really saying here is don't throw your life on the trash heap. If there's something in your life, some small thing in your life that keeps you from becoming the, the person that you ought to be, the kinder, wiser, happier person that you are called to be, if there's one thing in your life keeping you from that, throw that thing on the trash heap, but don't throw your whole life on the trash heap. I would dare say this is not even about the afterlife. It's about this life and the things we throw away and the things we keep. But the text overall is not really about hell. It's about separation. It's about inclusion and exclusion. The disciples come trying to exclude someone, a follower of Jesus, because he's not a member of their club. And Jesus tells them, leave him be. He goes on to say, everyone will be salted with fire. In other words, everyone's going to suffer in this life. And that's true, isn't it? Everyone's going to suffer. Don't make it worse. Have salt in yourselves. Be yourselves. And be at peace with one another. Keep your flavor. Do your thing. Let others do theirs. Not everybody has to be like you. That is a hard lesson to learn, isn't it? Not everybody has to be like you. So today is a day that churches have been asked to speak out against Christian nationalism. And as I said, Christian nationalism is the idea that conservative Christian values need to be the law of the land and that there should no, be no separation between church and state. I actually spoke out about this a few weeks ago when this church led the presbytery into taking an official stance against Christian nationalism. And it's timely. Because just yesterday in Monroeville, the new apostolic reformation was there and they held their courage tour, which they declare as a spiritual war for the soul of our nation. A spiritual war. Our own Peter Smith has been reporting on this group for the Associated Press. Christian nationalists claim to speak for all of us Christians and any who disagree with their tactics or their values 
they declare false Christians and evil. For Christian nationalists, we are caught up in a spiritual battle, a cosmic war with literal demons and angels that we cannot see. And everyone you meet is on God's side or the devil's side. <sighs> That's pretty extreme, isn't it? I think most people I meet are just trying to live their lives. They're just kind of trying to be happy and find meaning. I don't think they're trying to work for the devil. And most of them probably not for God either, actually. A cosmic spiritual battle that divides humanity. If you support gay rights, reproductive rights, gender inclusivity, separation of church and state, you're an enemy. And you need to be vanquished, either by being converted or by being silenced. And there are so many ways to silence a person. Mostly it's by marginalizing them. This is scary. How did we get here? How did this get to be the faith in our country today? It's like the American Taliban. Does this reflect the God that we see in the person of Jesus? Because if so, I'm going back to teaching. This cannot be the God that I serve. This God that tries to force an agenda on people. Yes, we must love the nation that God has committed to our care. And we must serve it. But we must not confuse it with God's kingdom. For to do that is idolatry. And to force any values on anyone in the name of Christ it kind of undermines what Christ is about. And really, drag queens are not the problem. They're not hurting anybody. Let them do what they do. Who cares? The problem is greed. The problem is lust for power. The problem is fear. Because when we're afraid, we will retreat into our corners and try to be safe. And apocalyptic movements have always risen out of fear. But if America is a Christian nation, what does that do to our Jewish and our Hindu and our Muslim and our agnostic and our atheist neighbors who ought to have the same rights as us? It squeezes them to the margins. And you know who is also always in the margins? Jesus. Jesus is always in the margins. He's always with those who get squeezed out the desperate, the poor, the disadvantaged, the unloved, the migrants, the gender queer, the prisoners, the undeserving. And which of us really deserves our blessings? To some degree, I think we're all kind of undeserving. I didn't earn my place in life. The point is that Jesus doesn't call us to create a society where one camp rules and where everyone falls into line or gets pushed out. What Jesus says when confronted with that kind of thinking is leave him alone. Have salt in yourselves. Be yourselves. Do your thing. Keep your own flavor. But be at peace with one another. Be you. Do you. Let others do the same. That's the ethic that I see here in this passage in Mark, the ethic of Jesus. Jesus has friends that we don't know. And ironically, it is often the people who lay no claim to Jesus who get Jesus better than those who lay claim to Jesus. So I came across a cartoon just in time for this sermon, a one-frame cartoon, and it says the three kinds of Protestants in America. Three kinds of Protestants. And the first is Pastor Susan. And Pastor Susan is an older lady. She probably has very fashionable, maybe librarian glasses. Unfashionable, I should say. And she has a rainbow stole. It's this thing, but it's a rainbow color. And she's got her clerical collar. And she is saying, may the great guava God continue to enlighten us with her infinite queerness. Okay, so that's supposed to be the main line, Christians. The second is old pastor Billy Bob, frowning in a necktie, holding up his Bible and yelling in all caps. The good book says all those who wear sandals are damned to burn in the eternal fires of hell. That's the second kind of Christian or Protestant fundamentalists. And the third, the third is young, hip Pastor Brody in a t-shirt. And Pastor Brody is saying, hey, cool dudes, 
Who wants to come to our Sunday laser spectacular service? 30% off at the church cafe for first time customers. And that I guess is the mega church evangelical Protestants. Frighteningly kind of accurate. You've got your mainliners, you've got your fundamentalists, and you've got your evangelicals. And they're all okay, as long as they don't try to force themselves on anyone. As long as they let you be you, and you let them be them, it's fine. My parents have a child in one of each of those camps, and two in none of, none of those, two in no camp. Faith is a matter of the heart, and matters of the heart cannot be forced, and they cannot be legislated. They have to be adopted welcome, with welcome. Who's in and who's out? That is the question on the disciples' minds when they see a stranger claiming to do things in Jesus' name, and they don't like it. And so what does all this mean for us today? It means that we are to live our Christian lives, to have salt in ourselves. But America can't really be a Christian nation. Because once we legislate that, our Christianity loses its soul and it becomes something else. It means that the spirit of Christ is often present among people where we do not expect it to be present. It means that we are called to live out our faith and never force it on anyone. This is a call to mutual, mutual love, to tolerance. Have salt in yourselves, be yourselves, keep your identity and be at peace with each other. Amen.